Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, this is going to be hardware for speedrunners and streamers. Uh, my name is Lat Mackey, and I'll first introduce the panel. So before we get into all the ins and outs, um, if you're ready for some geeking and nerding out, you are in the right place, I promise you, okay? I'll start with my right. Go ahead and introduce yourself. I am Duango AC. I'm keeper of TaskBot. I'm also the ambassador for taskvideos.org and the president of the North Bay Linux Users Group and an advocate for Linux. I'm Tina Hacks. I do speedrunning and tasking and programming and hardware hacking and stuff. And is a fellow Linux streamer. That's true. And I'm Evan Grill. Uh, apparently, I'm a moderator at speedrun.com. Uh, <laughs> I like to do console modding, and I do media production in my daily life, so this kind of hardware is second nature to me. And just a little bit of my background, um, I, I'm more of a hardware enthusiast. I'm definitely the novice on the panel, but um, I, I have a lot of experience in video production, IRL. That's what I, my strength, and that's where I come to from a lot of these things. So why are we here? What is the whole idea of this whole thing? Um, this is like a little bit rundown of what we're actually going to be doing, but we're going to start here at the intro and vocabulary. And there we go. OK, cool. Um, so the idea for this whole panel was I started speedrunning about almost two years ago now. And when I took my first steps and I wanted to move on from emulation into hardware, I didn't quite know what to do. And I know there's Google and there's all these places. There's a lot of resources nowadays that help us. But even so, it can be kind of confusing. And I was just, there was this whole world that I struggled with. Like, how do I get my Nintendo onto Twitch? Like, you know, how does this whole thing work? And so I went, I, I ended up going into a lot of different streamers' streams, asking questions. And I was still, I felt bad for taking up their stream with these questions about technical things. So the whole idea here is hopefully by the end of this, this could be kind of a place where we discuss how you get from, Here's the Nintendo. How does it get it to? How do we get it on stream? And how do we get it to look good? And those type of things. On top of all that, this is really for the enthusiast. Um, we're we're going to be talking a little bit technical at times. And if you have any questions at the end, there's a we're going to have as much Q and A time as will let us keep the room open for. So feel free, bring your questions. Let's start from there. The secondary goal of this whole panel type of thing was just to get these people on stage and have a conversation with them. <laughs> these are some of the smartest people I've ever met, and they are so enthralled in all of this stuff. It's like how can you pass an opportunity to get these people and talk about hardware. So all that being said, we're going to start from that and use that as our basis. We're going to go over just a couple of quick basic things about so terminology. So if you haven't had any sort of experience with anything, any of this stuff, you know what we're talking about when we're starting. We'll start with connectors and connections. And oh, I don't even have the art. There's, we're going to go basic from analog to digital. And a lot of the old consoles, such as Nintendo 64, this is an old PC engine, Nintendo, these all were analog consoles. So knowing that there's some sort of conversion that's going to be happening to get them into the computer is kind of important. Basics of the basics, kind of from quality level here, we start with RF, which is you know your coaxial connection, which I don't have out here because it's still in the backpack. You can move up to composite, which is you know your one little RCA connector. Um, S-video, which I don't have an S-video up here. You can move on up into component, which is your, your uh, red, green, black, and also, I'm sorry, your red, blue, green, and your audio cables as well. We have a SCART connector, thanks to Evan. This is actual Evan's oh, SCART connector. There's one over here, too. Oh, yeah. one over there, too. What are, let's, let's start from there. So as we move up from quality, um, Evan, let's start with you. What, what, is the, the, what, are the jumps, what are the jumps in qualities from like you know, RF to composite to composite? So there's a, a decent jump from RF to composite, and then um, from composite to S-video. And then from S-video, as you move up, you're, you're getting a lot smaller increases each time. Um, from component to SCART, we're assuming, so SCART's a connector that actually can carry composite, yeah, S-video, and RGB all in the same thing. But when we refer to SCART up here, we're going to probably be referring to RGB specifically. When you go from component to RGB, there's not much of a difference. They're mathematically identical. There's variations in the color spaces, so you'll see different colors will look a little bit different in each one. Um, but otherwise, uh, once you, that's the end of analog. There's, there's not much higher quality in analog. But then as you step up, you're going to get to um, DVI and DisplayPort and HDMI like you have there, which all have actually compatible video signals. You can convert to one from one to the other pretty easily. When we're starting with things, is there any difference in quality, or why would I choose component over SCART or vice versa when I'm getting into consoles? And that's for anybody on the panel if anybody wants to jump in on that. Is there a benefits? Con Price versus quality. I mean, really. Yeah. Okay. It depends um, on what country you live in, too. 
If you live in Europe, SCART's really cheap to get into because all the TVs have SCART. There's SCART switchers everywhere. But in America, we didn't use SCART. We used component video, YPBPR. Um, so if you're in America and you buy a consumer CRT from the late 90s and early 2000s, um, you're going to get something that probably has component on it. So yeah, that's component worth Component S video, yeah. typically. Yeah. Price-wise? Oh, sorry. Go, go. <clears throat> There's definitely a very notable difference in color quality when you jump from compo a composite video, single yellow RCA type jack, to S-video. Because S-video breaks out the luminance into its own pen. That makes a substantial difference in color quality. Not necessarily as much on sharpness, but it, you'll definitely see a jump there. So it's oftentimes different kinds of improvements as you, as you move up the stack. Is there a recommendation, or would you prefer to stick with one? Let's let's say I'm starting in the states. I want to and I want to play Nintendo on stream. Is is should I look? Start, should I start with the component, or should I? Does it matter one way or the other? Well, if by Nintendo you mean the original Nintendo, Sorry, NES, yes. your only option is going to be composite okay. because they didn't have an S video out for that. Got it. At least not for average human beings, anyway. Uh, you might have gotten very, very lucky. I, I can say there were some officially shipped consoles. If you had a top loader and sent it in for repairs, there was, there was this one minor loophole where you might get S-Video back. But by and large, you're going to end up with composite as your best possible uh, output. And it's not bad. It, it, it's certainly better than RF. If you're at the SNES level, from a cost perspective, you're going to find the best bang for your buck there is to stop at S-Video, at least in the United States. Once you pass S-Video, everything gets much more expensive. And we will get to that in just a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so all that, keeping all of that in mind, let's move on and talk uh, for a little bit here about RGB. Um, you may have heard these terms, but if you hadn't, the RGB is, and this is actually directly from uh, RetroRGB.com. So if you're interested in any of this kind of stuff, it's a great site to start with, to understand and to know what you want to get into. But RGB is very simply the best possible video quality output you can get from a classic game console. Um, many consoles require a modification to actually get RGB out of the console. Some consoles the, do not. They, they may require just something you can plug into or may have it built in. <laughs> um, I'm going to, I know Evan has extent. so because I am really dumb when it comes to a lot of this stuff, <laughs> I've sent almost all of my consoles to Evan to help me out with this stuff. And I, I guess, first of all, how do you determine whether a console is capable of an RGB output signal? Um, mainly look at people that have looked at it closely. Google. Um, yeah. Uh, all of the 16-bit era consoles are capable of uh, RGB out with slight exceptions on certain revisions, um, but they are capable with a simple mod. Um, 30, all the 32-bit era, the PlayStation, the Saturn, uh, the Nintendo 64 isn't by default, at least not in America, but it can be modded. Um, the older stuff, it if you can get it into like Atari, um, NES, if you get those modded even for S video, you're you're ahead of the game. If you drop by Tina's stream, I, I believe all of your consoles output RGB. Is that accurate? Yep. Why did you choose to go down the RGB out, uh, mm -hmm. route in the first place? So with my stream, I wanted just to be able to. Uh, have the the picture quality that I was putting on the stream uh, because I care a lot about things like preservation, making sure that you know, the the gameplay experience itself can be experienced by as many people as close to what the real experience is as possible. So because I was in a situation where I'm okay with hardware modifications and I had an NES that didn't at the time have RGB out, I bought the board, which was pretty cheap compared to actually just purchasing a modded NES. And it seemed like a fun weekend project to mod an NES. And then, uh, well, I already had one that did RGB out, and most of my other consoles already supported it. So it was just a matter of purchasing cables at that point. Oh, it's all about the cables, by the way. <laughs> We'll get to that. We, that's a very good uh, point. Um, and then I, I, there are some drawbacks to pursuing uh, your output in RGB. And I think obviously the most obvious one is cost. There is really no modification or any way you're going to get an RGB output signal without some sort of investment, even if you do all of the modifications yourself. So it's pr something to pretty much to, to understand that if you're going to go down this route, it's going to cost money. But I, I think 
the benefits, especially if you're in like like what Tina was saying, you know, the preservation aspect of this whole thing, or or producing the best possible signal. There's really there's second to none. There's no, I mean, as of right now, there's really no other way to, to get it out mm -hmm. without modification. Anything else we should understand or know about RGB before we move on? Just that she's a bad influence, and I went down the rabbit hole because of her. <laughs> so now my consoles are all RGB modded too. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Um, as we get into, uh, the, we're going to talk about cables in just a second. But before we get to that dis, uh, point, um, there, if you're just starting in speedrunning or streaming, emulation is a wonderful solution. Mm -hmm. And th there's, we're not good, we're going to stick away from hey, is is emulation legit or in that kind of conversation. We're going to have a little bit more important one. What are the, some of the drawbacks and also the benefits of uh, emulation versus using your original console? Like why would we choose to do one or the other? I think it's first important to start with some of the importance and the value in emulation. And Duango, I'm gonna I'm looking at you because I think you you've been such an evangelist, but also it's such it's there's so many so much value brought to the table uh, as far as speed running and streaming uh, goes for emulation. Tell, tell, what are some of the benefits of speed running? So I mean, uh, emulation. A lot of the big benefits of emulation are that you are getting a lot more tools that you would normally not have. Things like the ability at any time to save a state and go back to that. So if you're practicing, you can quickly cycle through. Some of those features have been brought to consoles through things like SD2 SNES, but they're, you're going to pay for that too. So that's another part of the topic. Um, so there are a lot of tools that just come for free. There's also some tools that give you an edge in very different ways. You can because it's an emulator, peek at what's going on in memory. You can set up scripting to automate finding certain things. You can discover tool-assisted techniques that might influence your real-time run. But there's also some other subtleties. Accuracy is sometimes a trade-off. If you want the most accurate core, specifically for Super Nintendo in particular, you're going to have to have a pretty beefy computer to do it, because if you want accuracy, you need to, you need to spend the cycles on it. Uh, so sometimes, or to run it real time. Yes, <laughs> if you want to run it at, at, at the real real time speed, you might have. So there's some sacrifices there. Maybe instead of picking a truly accurate NES core, you use Quick NES, which makes some small changes that might not be 100% accurate to the real hardware, but are close enough. And they're often close enough, we can sometimes even get console verification out of them. But that's a whole other topic. Uh, but you do have some trade-offs there. Uh, there are some cases where original hardware, even though it is the gold standard, isn't always the best choice. And this is kind of subtle. One of the things that bites us is that the Super Nintendo came out 25 years ago. It had a 21 megahertz main clock and a 24.576 uh, megahertz sound clock. The main clock is a quartz crystal. The sound processor is driven by a ceramic oscillator that varies over temperature and is now 25 years old and varies by age too, which means that you can sometimes find consoles that are so out of spec, they play notes that are off key. <laughs> it's rare, but it happens. Basically, over 25 years, and as the consoles continue to age, that ceramic part is falling further and further out of specification. And maintaining the hardware can be a pretty hefty cost. So sometimes the original hardware is not the best choice. Well, that brings up a good point. So when something like that is falling out of spec, how does that affect the end user? If I'm the person using my Super Nintendo that no longer is operating the way it's supposed to, how does that affect me as, as, as a person? Or in, as in the case of Super Metroid on the Super Nintendo, it might affect you by taking longer to get through door transitions because the main CPU is waiting for the sound processor to say, hey, I'm done processing this sample. If your clock is out of spec and it's running lower than it should, it's going to take longer, and those frames add up over a long run. Yeah, think about arm pumping, how we say, hey, this only saves one frame, but you do it a lot. Well, going through doors, you're only losing some frames, but you're going to go through doors a lot. Mm -hmm. So there are some instances then that I may be actually having a more accurate experience if I'm emulating the hardware properly. In some cases, yes. In some cases. Wow. <laughs> it's crazy. OK, that's awesome. I mean, so there's some really, there's, there's some really important benefits then to emulating. Yeah, to and I, I want to expand on something yeah. that Duango just said. These consoles aren't being made anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, in many cases, the chips that they're made of, they're not manufacturing anymore. Emulation is critical for us to preserve all the work that went into the 64, the Super Nintendo, it, name a console. Emulation ends up being super, super important just to preserve these games. Retropreservation is a very key thing that drives why I do what I do with TaskBot, because I'm in an era where I still have working hardware 
and I can preserve what that experience was really like on the original hardware for future generations. It's not the same as playing it, but at least I can preserve it in video form that can be copied infinitely. And because we are eventually going to reach a point where this equipment doesn't work anymore, and we can't replace it. Yeah. And to add to that, um, when we're talking about emulation for preservation, we're not just talking about software emulation. We're talking about hardware-based emulation, too. Like, how many of you guys have heard of the Analog Super NT? A handful of you guys? Yeah. Uh, those are FPGA. That's hardware-based emulation. It's not original chips on there, but it is something that's preserving the, the gameplay experience for future generations. Yeah, and those are really close. I know I've seen you do some, uh, some verifications on the Super NT. It, it is close. It operates differently. In that case, as a quick aside, they're using PLLs, phase-lock-looped phase, phase um, logic to tie a whole bunch of different clocks together. It's close, but it's not the same. Right. And you're always going to make some kind of compromises when you're swapping out different components. One last key note on that, there are minor differences, especially with the N64, across various different mm -hmm. revisions of the console that might affect how your console behaves. Interesting. So it, to, you, you, when you're making your decisions <laughs> about some of this stuff, you really they're asked to do some research. What kind of experience do you want? What, do you, what, do you, yeah, what and, games are you trying to make? In that particular case, there's a very limited set of knowledge about what those hardware differences are. Hmm. We're still, there's someone in my community that's actively researching and buying different consoles to see exactly how different they are. And in many cases, they're substantially different to the point that a run will not sync on certain consoles we've tested. Um, we're going to go through these next couple points just a little bit briefly, but then what are some of the drawbacks if I'm speedrunning or if I, if I want to uh, emulate uh, this on stream? What are some of the drawbacks to using an emulator when playing, when I'm emulating NES, for instance? Do you want me to take this one? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want. by all means. So the biggest one is going to be, guess what? You're now using CPU <laughs> resources. And if you're streaming on the same system you're using the emulator on, especially if you're using anything that's computationally demanding, you need a beefier rig for that. Okay. So sometimes you might end up needing to go the route of, okay, I've got a system that I'm using for playing the game on and another I'm streaming on. Oh, now you have to figure out how to capture that video. Sometimes that's a little challenging because you might be using 3D acceleration. Some other things like that might make it more challenging than it would be otherwise. Emulation does have a CPU cost to it. And similarly, you end up with additional latency compared to just playing on the original hardware. Especially if you don't have a good monitor. Yeah, you might notice more lag compared to it. If you don't mm -hmm. have a low latency monitor, you're going to feel that. And that is a great segue into the, you know, the benefits and the drawbacks to actually getting into using uh, original hardware. And um, I, I, when I first started my speed running, I used an emulator and um, it got to a point where I actually got good at a game, surprising. And um, I was, the buttons were not responding the way that I needed it to in, uh, instantly, which is, you know, which is one of the biggest reasons that I jumped into looking into purchasing some of my original consoles. Unfortunately, um, all the consoles that I had growing up as a kid were lost to who knows where. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of us can share that experience that mom, dad, Where's my console? Please tell me it's still... So no, it's not. Okay, great, cool, let's move on. Um, so there are some honest uh, to, uh, benefits, and there actually are some drawbacks to playing on uh, original hardware. Um, I'll, Evan, I'll throw it over to you. Tell us some of the benefits of using original hardware. Um, so the big one that everyone's going to tell you is the... And there's a reason there's quotes there for zero input lag. Um, the way that most consoles output to TVs, since they're doing it in analog, they're actually controlling the TV, essentially. They're telling it, draw this pixel, draw this. Basically, they're telling it, draw this scan line, draw this scan line, draw this scan line. And since they're doing that, there's no, there's no hardware in between that's slowing it down. Um, so what you end up with is you end up with a situation where um, from the minute you press the button, or the instant you press the button, to the instant that Mario jumps on the screen is vastly reduced compared to other other options. Um, in a lot of games, it's nearly instantaneous. In some games, there's two to three frames of lag just built into the game. That's why we say zero. It's just zero added lag. Yeah, so. and of course you're still you're going to move at the speed of physics. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Physics. If you uh, decide to run your uh, your video cable a mile or so, uh, you're definitely going to notice a, uh, some lag there. Yep. And then there are some honest drawbacks to using uh, original hardware. Um, 
Duengo or, or Tina, what are some of the legit concerns or, or problems that arise when using old consoles? Gosh, um, the, the NES, for example, I've had to recap mine. Uh, the capacitors are famously going bad on pretty much all of them. <laughs> Um, I suspect that all of us have probably recapped our, our NESs. But, or yeah, sent into our friends who can recap their well, NESs. Yeah. But, uh, I, I've basically the to, same thing it counts. I've managed to get away with not doing it yet. It's happening soon. What happens? That's actually a good aside. What happens when capacitors go bad? What, what, how does that affect? Uh, so one, of the, one of the things that's interesting about capacitors is they have electrolytic fluid in them usually. And it degrades. It dries out. Thankfully, the NES was not made during the era where they were just using bad capacitors that blew up, which means that you just get, you know, sort of weird behaviors that are not consistent across failing systems. So that's weird. My game crashed in a way that nobody else has happened, but it seems to happen, you know, with some regularity on my system. It's not impossible that that's, you know, some capacitor on the line just going bad. Yeah, you end up with... Um weird timing issues. Um, so the, the capacitors, one of the things they do is ensure that there's a consistent flow of electricity across the line. Um, as capacitors go bad, you're going to notice that sometimes timing won't line up. And sometimes uh, two things that need to be timed together perfectly are not timed together perfectly anymore. Um, it could be something as simple as audio and video not timing together, but it could be something more like red not timing with blue. Mm -hmm. And so now you have a red channel that's a, a frame just a or little a half bit frame offset, behind, yeah. and so you get this ghosting. It, it's, and I'm also getting the impression, and I haven't gone through this experience, I can vouch for it, any sort of old console is going to require some sort of physical maintenance to keep it running at top-notch shape. Yeah, you, you, yeah. You know, the classic example is probably going to be the NES pen header, or the, the cartridge oh, yeah. edge, yeah. yeah, because the especially the U.S. front loaders, <laughs> you insert the cartridge and push it down like it was a VHS tape, the downside was that you ended up degrading the connector and eventually you have to just replace yeah, it. Yeah, it turns out that spring tension wears out. Yeah. It's not a good idea. Yeah. And they're, 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 luckily, this has become such a big hobby, at least in the last few years, that there are third-party modifications that you can buy that are cheap and that anyone in this room can easily install, especially for, for to replace the pin header. Yeah. Uh, the blinking light win is, is a good example yeah, of that. Yeah, I've got a blinking light win on my US. It removes the spring action and it's literally just you plug it cartridge in just like you would to an n64 or genesis or super nintendo one last bit down the rabbit hole before we move on the lockout chip on the nes was classically known to be the biggest pain ever um what is the lockout chip if you're not familiar oh gosh the cic chip <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah without going yeah we could do an hour on that <laughs> we could um yeah, there's, it, it was Nintendo's first foray into anti-piracy, and uh, more so than anti-piracy, uh, anti-competitive behaviors. Uh, they didn't want non-licensed software running on their system. Uh, that got struck down in court, thankfully. Uh, but if you have an NES and you want to play Famicom games on it, well, the CIC chip is going to be a problem. Uh, most people either saw off the pin or they'll just short the pin to ground, which is what I did on my system. Uh, there's one specific pin on the chip that if you short it to ground, uh, turns out it just disables it, which is, you know, kind of handy. <laughs> uh, and because there's no actual encryption, this is legal. It does not violate the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Yep. However, one thing I should point out, as you keep making more and more of these modifications, you deviate from the original build. And there is a point where you can cross the line a little too far. In particular, on the N64, it's not uncommon to see someone literally put an HDMI port in it with a board to adapt it. The problem, though, is it makes it so I can't console verify things. Super Mario 64 doesn't work anymore because the timings are different. So at a certain point, you do have to be conscientious that some modifications you do might make your hardware last longer, but might make it less faithful. And that is a perfect segue for our next uh, chunk we'll take on here. Um, as I went down the rabbit hole, I wanted to stream uh, different consoles with uh, newer and better, I thought, better viewing experiences, which was the RGB and everything like that. Um, I needed some help because I, like, once again, had no idea what I was doing. Thankfully, Evan was in my chat. <laughs> so I would not have been able to do any of this. And that's the next chunk we're going to take on here. So there is a varying degree of console modifications dramatically varying degrees. I'm going to hand this section of the discussion over to Evan, and I, I take us through a little bit about, I don't know, benefits, challenges, beginning to end, what, about console modification. Okay, so I first want to point out that, that, yes, that's my bald spot in my hands there. <laughs> um, 
Not the most flattering. Yeah. There's a lot you can do. Um, it it really depends on the console. Some consoles don't need much, and some consoles need quite a bit. Um, I'm not sure. Let's start with this. Yeah, give me an idea. Open up the N64 there. Right. So um, Evan modded my N64 for RGB. Tell uh, th my idea was, or uh, I wanted to be able to capture a component signal out of the uh, N64, and I wasn't able to do that natively. N64, Mario 64. I don't run any N64 games, but I enjoy it very much. So this is actually the mod that Evan did on the N64. First of all, tell us a little bit on how we were able to do this and how you did it. Okay, so uh, the first thing I'm going to do is give credit to Voltar. Um, if you guys have heard of him, he's the uh, the brash uh, electrical engineer that designed this simple upgrade chip. Uh, all of the early model N64s, both Japanese, which this one is, and uh, American, um, have the ability to output RGB. There's just no connection from these pins over here to the actual uh, multi-out that the Super Nintendo, the N64, and the uh, GameCube all had. Um, for those, it's really just a simple mod. You just run some wires to this thing. This has a video amplifier on it, so you amplify RGB, and then you get it out of there. Um, if you have an older, or I should say a newer Nintendo 64, they, I don't, just to save money, I guess, they just eliminated that aspect, and so you actually have to have an entire separate board installed, and uh, that's what I'm installing in the, in the picture there. That's on my N64, um, and that's a lot more complicated. There are a lot more wires. Um, and the solder pads are a lot smaller, so it's a lot. That's something I would definitely tell tell you find someone that's a professional, unless you're really experienced with it. Surface mounted soldering is not fun. No, no. <laughs> a modification like this right. is twofold. So we've got we've 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 uh, modified the console, so now that we can actually output an RGB signal somehow. But we still have to be able to capture that signal, and it's not as simple as plugging. I mean, it's it's right now. I didn't I didn't want to mo modify any of my ports. You can easily do that as as, as uh, Duengo was mentioning. The HDMI mod is a very popular mod. And it's a great way, especially if you're starting off with just basic streaming equipment. Um, but thankfully, thanks to the folks at um, HD Retrovision, they make a cable that is a multi-port, which is the the multi out multi yeah. out port. So this is this plugs into a Super Nintendo or now the N64 GameCube, I believe. GameCube. Has, has uh, yeah, so. you got to do some modification. Yeah, do some yeah. modification yeah. to get it, and it outputs to my component signal. So it wasn't just as simple as modifying the console. It needed cables to actually be able to do it. The third part of that <laughs> is that need to be able to capture this somehow, and. Um, most, or I'm sorry, I shouldn't say most. The most inexpensive capture devices, my experience was HDMI. Is that if you wanted a capture device, HDMI was usually the most least expensive. But I, I, I could, I didn't. You can get composite capture. Composite capture. Yeah. yeah. Composite and and S video actually. With uh, if you're not running on Linux, uh, which is why neither Duango nor I own one of these. Uh, the GV USB two is mm -hmm. is famously very very good. I also managed to get what I call my Crapture card. My Crapture card is a $10 Easy Media or Easy Cap type card. It does work in Linux. It is crap, <laughs> but it works. But it works. It you works. You get signal. You get signal. It, it's not going to look great, but you will get signal. You might have some really bad buzzing on the audio channels, but it's $10 on Amazon, and it's a, it is a place to start. Yeah. I wouldn't stay there very long. <laughs> but that said, there's there's. Um HDMI is a really inexpensive way to capture video. The, uh, the one that Matt's showing you there, you can get those on eBay for $25 or $30 if you catch the right auction. They're 50 otherwise. Um, but I spent a lot more on that when I bought this. You, well, you also bought like it when it was top of the, top of the right, line. Right, it was right, exactly. Um, and, and those are great. And all your modern consoles, if you guys are playing on PS3, PS4, they all have HDMI out, um, and they can all be captured on there. Uh, PS3 has a caveat, and we can talk about that later. But um, <laughs> the, after the talk, the question though is: is how do you get old stuff into HDMI? And I know that was going to be the Matt's next question. Um, <laughs> there's a couple different options, and Tina's got them both in front yeah, of her right now. Sitting right in front of me. Um, one is the it's, RetroTink 2X. These are relatively new. Yeah, uh, I've only had a chance to play with it here. I don't have one myself. Uh, but for anything that's, you know, composite S video component, it's all labeled here, and the camera probably can't see it. By the way, that is a 3D printed case made by the guys at World 9, so there's an actual raw circuit board you'd get. Yeah. But yeah. there are designs available. There are available. also cases, and yeah. you can grab the, the RetroTink, the 3D models off of Thingverse. Which is exactly what those are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is a great way to get your consoles unmodded, 
um, to an HDMI output that yeah, will just, work on I most went TVs. I purchased and... a used NES. I'm getting, you know, composite out, and I just want to put it on my stream. Uh, this will take that. You'll get a 480p yes, uh, signal out. It'll do pass through if you have a, a device that'll capture 240p over HDMI, but yep. realistically, that's it, rare. Yeah. So it'll get you to a signal that is common well, enough to capture. Exactly. And common enough to work on your TV. Uh, how many of you guys have plugged in a old console to your modern TV? How good is that experience? <laughs> it's pretty bad. Uh, it, it the most modern TVs don't uh, even know what 240p is, so they just assume that it's 480i, and you get situations yep. where instead of your character flashing, they just disappear. Yep. <laughs> it, it, it runs in 480i degenerate mode, I think is the official there name of go. it. <laughs> there you go. Degenerate is a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this will output in 480p. This is around $100. And the, the thing to note about both of the things that we're going to talk about here, the retro tank and then the OSSC, uh, what is quite nice about these is that televisions do have digital processors. They can take in that analog signal and you know do some processing on it. These are much faster at doing that. The, <laughs> the lag that you get, yeah, the, the latency that they incur is, in the OSSC, it's a matter of, I believe, two scan lines. I don't know what the lag is on the RetroTank, but it's pretty much guaranteed to be lower than your modern television. Yeah, and they, they, I, they both, their official claims for both are sub one uh, frame. So you shouldn't see any added lag unless you get really weird timings. Um, the other one we wanted to talk about was the OSSC. So this is the, it's a little older than the retro tank, but yeah. it is also much more capable. It has um, VGA in, SCART in, and component video in. You can see there's two of them here. Yep. Um, they output, the older ones output DVI, but in general, the modern ones output Yeah, HDMI. if you were to purchase a new one today, you would get HDMI out. And they'll support up to uh, 5x scaling, which is 1080p, uh, so 1920 by 1080, like your modern 1080p sets do, or uh, 1600 by 1200 if you're using a 4x3 set. So if you, if you can buy, in some cases, you can buy older one of these and then really old uh, 4x3 monitors and, and get a really decent experience out of it, too. Yep. As we're moving into this, and I'll get to you, there's some <laughs> important things to know in that not every capture card is created equal. And that's one of the issues I had right away when I first used, started using the OSSC was anything more than 2x, anything more than 480p, the Elgato wouldn't handle. And uh, I was via HDMI and or via the component. It was struggling with both of those signals um, as they're, 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 they're not standard, right, because it's... Well, it's not exactly a 240p that, it, that something's output. It's like 244. Or something. I can't remember exactly. Well, the the thing that happens, and and my my co-panelists can probably correct me here. Um, the big thing is that these don't use a frame buffer, so they mm -hmm. take the same clock uh, in as the same clock out. Yep. Um, HDMI, if I recall, the the specs for HDMI. It is exactly 60.0 hertz. Yes. Which 59.98 um, is not. Yeah. Yep. And 60.03. Yep. And 60.09. And every console has different timing. On CRTs, that didn't matter because remember, we, we said that. We're just uh, controlling the cathode gun. It's yeah. telling the TV how to run. Um, with, with a case like this, it's, that's not the case. This is the TVs are expecting, especially TVs, are expecting very specific timing signals. Uh, computer monitors tend to be, accept a much broader more, range. Yeah. So, so let's talk about one other device. He's got an Elgato capture device. This one does not work in some in all operating systems. It works in Windows. Was not going to work in my Linux operating system ever. Uh, although I think somebody has tried, but you did awesome. Uh, so this is a Magewell HD capture device, HDMI capture device. These are three hundred dollars. <laughs> they're not cheap. Um, they're well built but they expect a broadcast standard quality signal. And because they built this for professional use, it doesn't like the weird timing coming off of a Nintendo. So that leads us to the, if you're really in this game and you're really throwing money at it, there's one other option, which is you do accept a frame or two of loss, of, of latency, and you get one of these things. Now, note the size difference in the equipment we're talking about here. Um, we're also the price. That. So this is a DVD-O iScan HD+. Plus. Tina has a very similar type of console. Yep, I've got the iScan VP50. I shouldn't say console. Uh, uh, this is a 
very high end. Was it's over, a video processor. It is a full on video processor, yep. and they were over a thousand dollars when they were sold new. Yeah, they were real expensive, and now that they're not making them anymore, they are becoming real expensive again. Yes, uh, they are hard to find, but they're not made of unobtainium yet. You're looking at about three to four hundred dollars right now. If you get real lucky on eBay, you can get a VP50 uh, at about 150 working with the power cable, which matters. Which does, because this is a weird plus six volt at five amp, which is kind of hard to come by. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's a very strange cable type. So the why would you have this? Well, it is going to incur one to two frames. You're generally going to want to have some solution, and maybe we're going to get into this next, where you fork your video signal off before you get to this. But this will clean up the signal enough so that you can capture it on anything. I even use it as a little bit in a slightly different way. I use the OSSC to get up to 720 to line double my NES and SNES similarly. And then I pass that image off to the DVD OI Scan HD Plus, which takes it from 720 to 1080p. So that's a way to do it if you have a capture path that is a little bit more finicky. Yeah. And it's not uncommon. It also fixes some other weirdness with how the NES handles the first horizontal line, but it's a whole other conversation. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about our setups. And before we get too into the weeds a bit, um, realize that we've all been doing, we've been putting together our setups for a little bit. Putting this all together right at first is going to sound a little crazy. Oh, no, that's my stream, yeah, isn't it? it? <laughs> <laughs> if you oh, drop no. a chunk of yeah. cash just for all of all of the kit that you would need forever, like that's that's real expensive. Yeah. I think pretty much all of us have accumulated our, our stream gear over the course of years. Yes, many what, years. One of the benefits of, we've talked about moving on to, to, to real original hardware is the experience you get while using it. To really uh, uh, benefit from that, <laughs> you need to have a monitor that can take advantage of that. Typically, that's been a CRT. You'll see a lot of people, you know, there's CRTs all around here at, the, at SGDQ. Um, there are lagless uh, um, LCDs as well. That um, They actually have some here that are actually... The BenQs are really nice. Yeah. And, and I've been quite, impressed. Yeah. Not only that, the BenQs are nice. They also have some new cheaper ASUS models. They they, they're trialing. They're much cheaper than the BenQs. They don't have as many inputs, but they seem to be very good at low latency. And the, so I was really surprised at the experience. It was very similar. I mean, it was... It was really tough for me to cipher between CRT and the BenQs I was using over here in the practice room. So, so if there's different routes. Um, I, if for those of you who, ha who live or, 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 or have significant others in your life, um, there's something I like to talk about called the spousal acceptance factor. <laughs> and bringing some of this stuff home, if you can just you can imagine your, your partner uh, giving you the looks. But I'll tell you, there are options that are, first of all, really awesome and beneficial uh, and aren't, don't take up as much space in your office, in your living room, in your bedroom, wherever you're doing this kind of stuff. Um, we're gonna go, let's move into a little bit about, I, I really want to go down the rabbit hole here on, on Duango Stream here. because this, So the image you see up on the, on the, uh, the slide here is Duango Stream. And if, if you ever get a chance, you have to visit it. Um, I still don't know what the hell is going on in this room. <laughs> <laughs> and I love every second of it. A lot. A so lot's going on. A lot, yeah. a lot is All always going on. I don't know if Duango knows yeah, everything right. that's going Sometimes on there. Sometimes when my moderators are in full swing, I have no idea what's going to happen next. <laughs> if you're running any sort of, of uh, you're, at some point, you're going to need a switcher. To, to get some of this stuff to actually happen. There are, a, there are many, many different options. This, this is you know the creme de la creme up here. This is a wonderful option. I will say I started with, this is an otaku switcher. It's under $100 and it has, I can't remember, six inputs? It has six inputs, SCART or component. Now it only outputs one. You can output via SCART or you can output via component. What their setups you're going to hear about in a second actually have multiple outputs and that's the way that they have it set up. But this is an option to start with if you want to start at some level where you want to start switching between your different consoles and things like that. Um, Duango, can you tell us a little what's going on here? Almost, but before I do, I want her to talk about the shiny bow that she introduced me to and I then bought because yeah, I'm a Yeah, so in, in terms of how it looks, it's going to be very similar to that. Uh, I've got the six input version, I think, Duango. You've got the four got input the four. version. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, skirt is this big chunky thing and uh, switchers are very uncommon in the US. Uh, switchers that work well and also work on a 60 hertz electricity line are fairly well or fairly rare. Um, Shiny Bow is the brand that I've found I have the best luck with. So uh, what my signal path is, is I've got console doing RGB over SCART out uh, into this six input switcher, which itself has two outputs. It's a matrix switcher, which is the really important part. This one is not a matrix switcher. Yep. You only have one output. Right. So 
I've got two outputs. One goes just directly to a CRT. The other one goes into uh, the one of these that I have that's permanent at home. This is my travel one, uh, which then goes into a DVDO, which goes into the capture card that I have, uh, which is the, the signal path is exactly what Duengo has described previously. Clean up the signal, accept that little bit of lag, but since it's just for the capture, that lag doesn't matter. I'm playing on a, on a CRT, so. Yeah, I have a very similar path. Uh, my video path is almost identical to hers, except I also, in addition to the SCART matrix, I have a four by two HDMI matrix switcher. <laughs> um, this is a splitter. This is an HDMI splitter. Uh, might be useful for certain consoles. <coughs> PS3. Um, so. He, sa he said PS3, by the way. Uh, <laughs> anyway. So this because is a, PS3 needs to go out to two different uh, Yeah, devices. this is a one in, yeah. two out. I have a, a four by two matrix switcher where you can have any input go to any output. I generally have them be the same, but that's the only thing that's different on the video path. But the audio path, I have much more complex. Yeah. So my audio path, I split out my video signal the same way, and one path goes to my PVM. Uh, we both have professional video monitors that yep. we were able to pick up used that oh are now well, All four of us cost. do. What's that? All four of us do. Oh, what? Really? Yes. Yeah, yeah. they're awesome. They are um, amazing. Yeah. But now that's when you see this I is the thing. <laughs> I didn't start with a PVM. I just sort of got addicted and be prepared once you head the down The good this news path. is that at a certain point, there's nothing left to buy. <laughs> I'm, I'm finally <laughs> yes. almost there. That is absolutely not yes. true. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> there is a light. <laughs> so I just don't believe it. We all have uh, PVMs. And the nice thing is that we can get a really good, clean image to look at when we're playing a game. Now, it might, it might be strange that I'm the task spot guy. Why on earth do I need a good monitor? But sometimes I need to be able to spot differences, and I, having that really clear image is really useful. And I play Link to the Past randos, so whatever. So what I do, though, is I split my audio off of the PVM, because all of that audio is going through the SCART cable, and it's forking off in both directions. But because my OSSC is her old OSSC that doesn't have DV, uh, is a DVI connection. It's DVI audio. out instead of HDMI, yeah. I capture my audio from the back of the PVM and then send that into a, brace yourselves, a $500 Behringer XR18. Not at all overkill. Not at all. It is $500. <laughs> but it has 18 sound channels. And, no, 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 no. Oh, is it's it smaller? Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's quite small. I mean, oh, I there's nice. components. We have an X32 okay. over here that's insanely huge. It's it's yeah. this wide. I'm looking okay. at it right now. It's huge. It's, it's a big boy. No, the XR18, yes, it is $500, but you get 18 channels out of a toaster box that's not very big. Okay. I, it fits under my seat in my car. I know I streamed with it. So that actually brings up, I, I want to touch on that point for just a moment. Why would somebody consider or want to use a sound mixer while they're streaming? One of the things that becomes apparent as you start to get a more complex setup. Now, more complex does not mean the disaster you see on screen here. <laughs> As you start to get a little bit more advanced, maybe it's just you and all you have is you in a game. But at a certain point, you might want to put that video that you've streamed live on YouTube later. And you're gonna need to do a few things. Specifically, you might find that in video editing later, you want to balance the audio between you and the game differently. You only need two channels to do that, but you need something that can do multi-track recording. Out, yeah. Exactly. The poor man's way is to, and brace yourselves, don't ever do this. If all you play is a mono console, yes, it is possible to force you to the left channel and your game to the right channel. <laughs> and then you can down mix. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, you will find that advice all over the internet. Yeah, yes. If you're playing nothing but NES, it is yeah, technically perfect. a way that you can do it. It is a way. There are better ways to do it. Granted, I'm going... There's no kill like overkill, okay? <laughs> the $500 soundboard I have is a lot. It's 18 channels. I am using 14 of them because of that. But <laughs> uh, in general, you're not going to need to go to that level of complexity. What it does give you is the ability to have a live mix that you have going to your, your OBS, if, if you're using OBS, your broadcast. You can have a second bus that's specific to what your folks over Discord are hearing. In other words, if you're playing a race with somebody, you don't want your game audio to be exposed to them because that might give them a competitive advantage and be kind of obnoxious. So by using a device like this, you can have your audio separated in such a way that the people you're talking to over Discord hear you, but not themselves and not your game audio and not your music or anything else you've got going on. There's one other subtlety to this that I want to 
a key in on. We've spent a large portion of this talk talking about video. The reality is, what's far more important to your viewers is audio. And I know that might sound a little bit unusual, but you'll notice it yourself. If you watch a YouTube video that has poor quality audio, see how often you check out. Your audio matters. And by going with a soundboard like that, I can use an XLR mic. I'm using an $18 XLR microphone. Tina, on the other hand. Uh, I've, I've got a slightly more expensive <laughs> XLR microphone. <laughs> <laughs> How much did you spend on your soundboard? Uh, my soundboard was not as expensive as yours. It was a couple hundred dollars. Uh -huh. And your microphone? You're not going to admit it, are you? It's, it's a lot. I, I'm using a CAD E100S. I'm quite fond of it. Um, I like it enough to have purchased two. Uh, because I have a, an entire stream set up that why I come with. Why buy one when you can buy two at that's, twice that's the right. price? That's <laughs> right. I thought you said there was two an upper limit to how much you could spend. There is. <laughs> Eventually. Eventually. It's, we it's, all it's, readily admit we all have problems. It's what's okay? available We're when you mortgage your house. My, my, that's right. Mics were 70 bucks. Yeah. So that, it's not to say that you have to spend a lot of money. I, now, I am not advocating the rent from Walmart approach, but... I did buy three microphones and at the end of the day returned one of them that wasn't as, as high of quality. I'm not telling you to do that, but I, I'm using an $18 microphone and... His stream sounds really good. It's, it's good enough. So if, and microphones... And there's a lot have, that you can do in post, just to note. Yes. Uh, microphones you know, have, noise floors are a thing, but so is post. Yeah. And that's one of the things. By spending $500 on my soundboard, I can do full EQ and all kinds of other things. I can DS it and some other things like that. So. I can't underemphasize, yes, we've spent a lot of time talking about video quality. Your audio quality matters so much more to your viewers. Yep. And I will uh, jump in there that Super Metroid is a, a great example of a game where you want the best possible audio quality going to your viewer. It's such an atmospheric game that really sucks you in with its soundtrack. Um, a poor microphone or a poor feed from your Super Nintendo into your, your, your capture is, is, is going to wreck the experience. Um, and furthermore, I'm mostly, I'm, I'm a, a nostalgia and enthusiast about this retro stuff. The better the sound is that I'm getting and the better, the reason I spent all this crazy money on the PVM and everything is because it takes me back to that moment when I I was eight years old and I was playing, you know, Super Mario Brothers 3 for the first time. I, 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 you really can't put a value on that kind of experience. And your viewer will appreciate that as well. Um, while it, it can be a heavy investment, more so than others, it's, there is definitely a benefit you get from it. And it's really, you won't know until you actually have it in the room and your viewer is, is experiencing it and you're experiencing it at the same time. Um, I'm going to push this forward just a little bit because we are starting to run just a little bit short on time. Um, but I, I think some really important stuff is that there are really great options at all price points. I, I think the, the $18 microphone is such a great, I mean, Evan runs this lav in, on his stream when he's doing uh, the, uh, the the console mods. That it, Amazon? Where did you get that? Off Amazon? Amazon. It's a boy uh, M1, I think. And it sounds wonderful. Just for the fact that the microphone's placed in a good spot. Yep. You don't have any impedance, I assume, running into you right into your computer or anything like that. Yep. So, you're getting a very nice quality to do so. Okay. Before we do move on, I'm going to be Please. as fast as I possibly can. The reason I got the soundboard I did is because, as you can see, my stream is really complex. On that one stream, I have audio coming from me, audio coming from my kids, audio coming from my, my laptop, audio coming from the console, audio coming from that little tiny square you see on the very bottom of the screen, which is literally a Super Nintendo that I'm shoving data into and forcing it to play my music. We, we, we play Super Mario World and then take over the game and it's my music player, 32 uh, kilohertz, 16-bit stereo, stereo audio. Most people don't need quite that many sound channels, but you might find that you want to separate out your mic, your music, and the console. And it, it can be really useful to have a physical set of sliders in front of you. So in addition to the soundboard, I also bought an X-Touch Compact. So I have physical motorized sliders to be able to adjust that on the fly while I'm streaming. It was a 200-ish dollar investment. My stream is much more dynamic as a result. As a much simplified version, I have a two-track mixer. It's a two-track mixer, so it's the console and my microphone. And it's a much it's simplified. It's 150 bucks. It's made by Samsung, and so it's, there are different options if you, you yep. know depending on where you want to go get into this. Um, we're gonna we're gonna move over here to some enhancements and accessories, some things that will, might make your stream a little more fun or make it a little more interactive, and some things that you can do. Make sure I'm getting all of these. Oops. There. Okay, let's go there. Um, this right here is an input display. This is what this does is it captures your NES controller, plugs in. 
into your NES, and the other part goes into your USB. It's able to capture your inputs on, on display for your stream. I'm going to throw this over to Tina because, first of all, I, Tina, did you build your own one of these? Yeah, I built my own. Uh, the one that you're showing off is done by Pidge. Pidge has made dozens of those, and tons of people in the speedrunning community use Pidge's work. And I will recommend them because she still makes them. I she believe. still makes them, she's awesome. um, and she's great. And if she was at this GDQ, I would have wanted her on the panel. She would have been sitting right. I, yeah. I did ask her before. Unfortunately, she was not here. But this is it's a wonderful device that she makes. But she made she makes this herself. Yep. And how do you go about making, because I believe you made your own as well, right? I made my own. Um, instead of using something like that, which is a cable, uh, I actually modified the controllers themselves because I wanted something that was self-contained. So all of the chips that are in there, uh, there's a little fatter area in the cable, which is where all the electronics are. Uh, those just live inside my controllers. And uh, I wanted something that was self-contained. I also, you know, it seemed like a fun weekend project to learn a little bit about how the controllers work because I didn't want to Google and I wanted to learn on my own because that's fun. That's what normal, rational, well-adjusted people do with their weekends. Is there a chip in here? Like how, how do, they, what's like some of the... Uh... Almost certainly that's going to be an Arduino. Okay. Um, probably a Teensy. Uh, Teensy is what I use for my mods. And what did you have to do to actually, con like, how do you get those inputs on your stream? What's that? So, all right, without going too into the weeds, um, the way that NES and Super Nintendo controllers communicate is with a, uh, with a, what's called a shift register. Uh, the NES sends, or the SNES or whatever, uh, sends a signal to the chip, says, capture all the buttons pressed right now, and then feed them back to me one by one when I ask for the next one. So what that's doing is that's just splitting out uh, each of those lines and just listening to them passively. Uh, if you wanted to, you could use that as the basis for a replay device. In fact, that's very similar to how the replay devices that Duango uses work. But in this case, it's just listening in. It's saying every time that a, that a bit goes over the line, just capture that and then send it to the computer. And then the computer, you know, on that side, you've got software that takes a look at that and figures out what the current frame is in terms of what's being shown. All without introducing any latency whatsoever, because because it's, it's just tapping the signal. line. Yeah. yeah. I will point out that I, Tina is a developer. She has this background in coding and things like that. So this is something that you could take on in a weekend. Is this something that uh, you know one of us? Is it how? What's the complication? Maybe not a weekend. Okay. Uh, it would take you a little longer. Uh, there's a lot you would have to learn, but it's not. A, not it's not. It's, it's out not of intractable. Reach. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I think that somebody this this would be a great first electronics project. Nice. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, and then some other like enhancements or the things you might want to consider. And this is just the start. I mean, really, you're, let your imagination run wild if you're thinking about ways to enhance your stream. I, I know it's complicated, but one of the things I love about Duengo's stream is that it's the imagination. It's very enhanced. It's, it's quite enhanced. <laughs> I mean, how many displays are you capturing? Or uh, how many devices are you using to capture all of that stuff? A, a lot. Okay. I have three separate cameras. I have uh, at least two video captures at any time, and sometimes as many as four, depending on what I'm up to. Uh, yeah. It, it's pretty complicated, and muxing that all together on a, on OBS in Linux is uh, entertaining, but it works. And you and you, you're limited. I mean, you're limited by the amount of PC bandwidth that you have. Oftentimes, and this is going to sound crazy, you're limited by your USB two controller capacity. Interesting. My my uh, stream machine has two PCI USB three cards added into it to give me the necessary bandwidth for the stuff that I'm doing. I imagine you've got the same. I built a task, what I call Task Ripper. It is a AMD thread ripper that is specifically built with a motherboard that had the most USB capacity I could get, and I still added an extra PCI uh, <laughs> adapter, and that wasn't enough. So then I added a four port big brother of this, four uh, equivalents of these, four HDMI ports uh, that could each do 2K uh, video for each port as a PCI card, because that was the only way I could get enough uh, into the computer. <laughs> And USB bandwidth is surprisingly the limitation on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, especially, and this comes up, by the way, if you are going the non-XLR route, if you have a USB microphone, like a, a what is it, a blue? Yeah, the uh, the Yeti is pretty popular, Yeti. yeah. That's going to need some USB capacity. Your nice 60 FPS camera, it's going to need some USB capacity. This capture device is going to need some USB capacity, and you're going to quickly find that you don't have enough, which is why streaming on a laptop can sometimes be a big pain. Also, uh, it, it's worth pointing out voltage. Uh, even if you're only using one device, you'll often see people ending up 
purchasing powered USB hubs just to run one device through it just so that you can supply the necessary voltage. No. I'm not saying you can cook an egg on here, but... You can cook an egg on there. <laughs> it... they, I've, I've got mine is, is just the slightly larger version. It doesn't get as hot only because it it's has more, more surface, surface area. area. <laughs> but these things are, what, they get, 14 watts? Yeah, they get real warm. Yeah, and that draw has to come from somewhere. So... In fact, I used to use one of those. I modified it. Uh, by using thermal epoxy to add heat sinks to the top of it. Yeah. Because yeah. I burned my finger picking it up once. Yeah, true story. Uh, we did a co-op goof troop, and yeah. I had this sitting on a table. With, with It was just a little bit too hot, and it was overheating and, and jumping out. <laughs> These things are warm. So USB is actually going to be one of the harder problems you're going to run into. Yep. We all laugh, but 14 watts is like the little light bulb in an easy bake oven and we all ate the food that came out of those. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I'm not saying it's 14 watts, but it feels it's, like it's it. a lot. It's but a yeah. lot. A similar or a different but somewhat similar complication you may run into. I just recently took the plunge and I haven't actually gotten it on stream, but I have a lot of production gear and I I've only I've used the uh, the Logitech C920s, you know, very basic a lot of streamers use that camera to start. It's they're good cameras. It's a wonderful camera to start. It's USB, it's easy to use, it just works and it's got autofocus <laughs> features, auto correction. If you want to move up and take another step and uh, depending on what kind of uh, rig you have set up, you'll need an extra capture device if you're going to capture uh, an HD camera plus. Um, I've got a Panasonic GH5 in the back there that I was using to start to capture some of my, my input. And I, I ran into a problem where there, was, uh, there wasn't a sync happening between the audio and the video. Depending on how you route, we were talking about routing before, having audio and video going in different places. Um, when you get into OBS, you're going to have to play around with your offsets by milliseconds, things like that. We talked about this earlier. Just a really quick, easy one is the clap. If you clap on screen while the camera can see you, Make sure you clap and release. That's yes. Yep. That's the other part. I'm doing a sync test for him when he has to do this later, by the way. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> and now we're good. We are recording external auto over here. So, yeah. um, but it's 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 an easy way to once you do is you record that you can play it back in VLC and actually frame count how offset the audio was to the video and then make that correction in OBS. Mm -hmm. um, it's simple and it's a great way to increase some of the quality of your video if you'd like to take that route. Most people are not going to have as many different video devices as I have, but one note: find the one that has the longest delay. Then sync everything to that. Sync your yeah. well, yes, because it's going to get interesting. You're going to do a amount of delay to sync your audio to that one video source, and then you might find that you have to go into your other video sources and add and maybe them. 20 20 milliseconds of delay to them as well to compensate to match up with your low, highest latency capture device. Yeah. Uh, on a similar note, uh, for OBS users specifically, uh, turn off your video buffering because it's not going to be consistent across runs of OBS. No, it won't be. Uh, <laughs> that took me so long to figure out, too. There's also a Next Frontier, and there was a panel right before ours. It was called uh, The Future of ROM Hacking. And the next kind of frontier we're seeing in, in, in our community is the, the, the flash cards. This is a, an EverDrive, and this one doesn't have one on it, but uh, the SD to SNES and others has the USB port has the it. USB port and you're actually able to plug that into your PC and send it information send and receive information you may have heard of the crowd control feature that's one of the ways taking advantage of hardware and software together and i think as these things keep evolving uh, i think crix just announced a new pro for the, the pro for the NES is coming out yeah. and i believe crix just said the genesis pro is going to be following that yeah mm. which, which is great because now i'm going to have to spend money on two more flash cards yeah. i thought you said there was a ceiling <laughs> there is once i have those flash cards <laughs> Oh, I'm believing you less and less. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, they're gonna, uh, we're going to have to close this up pretty soon. But I did want to open the floor to some questions. Before we get into some of the questions, if you'd like, um, we're going to keep the hardware out for just a little bit. If you want to come play with it, open it up. Uh, don't throw it against the wall or anything. Yeah. Like that, but, uh, <laughs> this, no. this, this all does belong to us. It's, yeah. not, it's not provided. But so. it's, you're more than welcome to come and, and, and check it out. Um, that being said, are there any questions for the panel? And if you please, would you mind an an uh, asking in the microphone? They yes. are recording this. So, Anybody from the floor? If you if oh. you have a question and and feel uncomfortable yeah. asking it, yeah, I think you can we're all going to make ourselves available Absolutely. after this. If it's something where you just had a, a quick question type have thing, yeah. or by, by all means, or or on Twitter, uh, Tina at least and and Matt and I are all on Twitter. Yeah, Dwango. Uh, Dwango uh, Mr. Taskbot Dwango's? is on Twitter. Dwango is not. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Dwango AC is not on Twitter. But. Mr. Taskbot is. So hi, I'm Altered Notions. Hello. Um, hi, <laughs> I actually do to, uh, streaming to Creative. 
I made the portal quilt last year and I made the Mega Man quilt this year. Oh, cool. Um, I have a setup with very bad cameras, so, uh, which is my next big thing to, to get, but I have a prep table, an ironing board, and a sewing machine, and soon to be a second sewing machine, and potentially my cat camera. How do I do this? <laughs> so I'm going to throw this to Evan because Evan has a sim I actually, similar. Yeah, if you saw earlier that there's a picture of two cameras. Um, the, the ones I'm using are the Logitech C920s, which are down to $50 a piece now. And they're, H, they're full HD um, cameras. They are and, only 30 frames per second, though. Yeah, but they I they think work. that'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. She's quilting. The 922 is a I don't know little how fast bit of a premium, think but it's 60 quilt. FPS. Yeah. I, I quilt fast. The machine goes quick, but... I think we can handle that many frames. Yeah. Um, the one thing I found with it, and this is going to be one of those that this may end up being news to a lot of people, um, the drivers that are provided by uh, Logitech are terrible. The drivers built, if you're using Windows, I'm going to assume you're using Windows, uh, the drivers built into Windows, if you do not install the Logitech drivers, you can run as many cameras as you want. As soon as you install the Logitech drivers, you're limited to do one camera at a time, and they... Yeah, they freak out. Alternately fail. Yes, they do, and yes. it's annoying. So what I yeah. what I I researched a bunch, and Logitech's answer was uninstall our drivers and just use the ones built into Windows 10. Wow. That's so, the official word. Yeah. I, my IT department. Okay. Up there, yeah, right. so. yeah. Thank you. No problem. That will help a great deal. The other solution is one that you're not going to necessarily want to try, but Linux doesn't have that problem. <laughs> We're actually a Windows and Linux family, so, oh, yeah. Yeah. so they got there some you experience go. there. Yeah, the V4L2 drivers are very, very good. Yeah. Mm. To each their own. Come on. Right, right. <laughs> I, and I run shame. several free BSD hosts. Yeah, no, B, no, no distro shaming going on here. No. I, I want to add to that that um, one of the things that uh, I'm can't thank these people enough and love them for is that, um, the, and there is no dumb question. The, the, no. When you, they, these people are passionate about what they're doing. And if, I, I am too. And if you ask me the question most of the time, I won't know the answer. So I'll send you to one of these people. <laughs> um, and feel free to stop by streams, discords, Twitters like that. Because oh, yeah. they, uh, we re like, we're really, like, we really enjoy Dwango it. and I probably answer questions about our setups Every couple days? Uh, every stream I get nerd sniped. Keep yeah. it up. I'm not going to say this is the typical, but within like 30 seconds of being in Duango's Discord, I had an answer. To, I mean, it was just amazing. So. And the two of them have so many viewers that they, uh, they sometimes miss chat as it goes by. Yeah. But I don't have that problem. Right. <laughs> that perfect. And you deserve that problem, so <laughs> follow, subscribe, Evan. All good. Fat. All right, looks uh, like we have another question. We have another question. That's great. Uh, hi, I'm Roguelink. Um, Hello. I'm garbage with hardware. Yeah. Uh, so generally speaking, I have this problem all the time every time I move, which has been more than I'd like the last couple of years. But uh, long story short, if I plug my camera into the wrong USB port in the back or just do it in a wrong order, I end up getting a voltage oversurge or something along those lines. Yep. Long story short, doesn't like it. Uh, you mentioned installing new boards for extra USB ports and stuff like that. Is the voltage thing more of a motherboard problem or something that you can so solve with basically extra cards? It is, yeah, yeah okay. it's, it's not something that you're likely to solve just by adding boards. We added boards for bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, to avoid your, your overdraw, what you're gonna wanna do is get powered hubs. Depending on which, I managed to find PCIe adapters that have a power connector on them so they can supply enough voltage to handle the cameras. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but, the, but keep in mind, the other solution is if you're not driving a lot of different devices, you can get a powered hub, mm -hmm. connect your device to the powered hub, and connect it to the USB port from there. Just know that does not solve it, the, band the bandwidth problem. problem. Right, yeah. right. Okay, yeah, it's mostly, I, I think it's mostly the, and this is usually an external thing, the powered hub? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. that, which is nice for a laptop, right. especially. It, yeah, because it's usually I have my mic, I have my capture card, and I have my camera, which my camera is usually the one that trips the surge because it's a 60 FPS, right. sure. 1080p camera. Yeah, so, so my setup, just to give you an idea, I've got three separate powered hubs. All of them are eight port hubs because that was the smallest well-rated powered hub that I could find. And car by some chance? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, but all of them have exactly one device plugged into them because I don't want, you don't get more bandwidth from it. And they're all going to individual uh, buses. 
So one, you know, just my camera in one, just my capture card in another, just my audio interface in another. And the idea behind that is that I am no longer pulling from the motherboard or from my PCI bus in terms of the power draw. They're only supplying bandwidth. I thank you. Or no power. Problem. Great question. Yeah. The the motherboard? No. No, 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 no. The 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 NCAR uh, USB hubs are only supplying power. Power, yeah. yeah. Extra power. So a couple of questions, and I'm just gonna be, I missed this whole thing, so if you already answered this, my apologies. Um, we'll make fun of you, it's okay. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> um, started streaming myself a while back, but never had time for it recently. But a common issue I ran into is just OBS just deciding to crash all the time. Hmm. Um, so just common solutions for that. Also working on upgrading my, my uh, computer since it's six plus years old, some mm -hmm. of the parts. Um, interested in CPU and what works best with OBS. Wow, good that's news a, that's, there. That's it, a long yeah. topic, though. So <laughs> good news there is that whatever modern hardware you get is going to work fine <laughs> with OBS. Um, everything like you've got a AMD and AMD setup, I think. Mine's AMD a little more complicated because I'm doing a PCI pass through to a virtual machine because yeah. the only place I let Windows be is in a sandbox in a virtual machine. <laughs> Which is reasonable. Uh, yeah. but, but, uh, but in general, the hardware side of things, do some research in, just in terms of what price you want to pay and you know what is well reviewed at the time. Uh, you're not going to, oops, I accidentally purchased an AMD CPU and it just so happens that that's not going to work in OBS. Good news. Right. Right now, you're pretty safe. You're pretty safe hardware-wise. One note, as you're troubleshooting OBS, move your profile out of the way, create a new one that's empty, yep. and see where it is that it falls over. And the good news is that OBS's crash logs are actually extremely high quality. Yeah. Just about every single one of the things that you can see show up in a crash log, you will be able to Google most of the time. The top hit is the OBS GitHub, yeah. which you're going to see, oh, hey, this is in the video processor portion or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's one other quick note I want to throw out there that you, we didn't get to, and I do know we need to wrap up soon. One fast note is once you get the video to OBS, you still have one minor problem. You have to transcode that or get that into H.264. You can make some quality speed trade-offs. In the case of Tina, I believe you're using NVE and C? Yep. And the upshot of that is you, by using NVIDIA's NVE and C encoding, you offload the H.264 encoding of your video that's headed out to your stream to your video card, which is nice. The downside, if you're really, really picky about quality, it's not quite as good as, in, as, as a software. software. So I actually do dual encoding. My setup in terms of OBS is real weird. I actually have three separate OBS instances when I'm streaming. Three? Uh, yeah. Even I only get to two. <laughs> so three specifically because doing local recording from V4L2 sync uh, crashes. I'm sorry that happens to you. That's yeah. To me. Yeah, it stinks. Okay, um, we should but, talk. But anyway, uh, yes, exactly what he just said is correct. The, that's the short version. Um, offloading to a video card, real nice for streaming, not great for quality for long-term preservation. Okay, thank you. No problem. There's one thing I wanted to add on just real quick too. The easiest troubleshooting thing to do with OBS, and I'm sure all of us have gone through this, but it's an easy one. Do one to, one thing at a time. Add, start with one source, mm -hmm. then add on another one, and you'll find where your crash is. That's an easy yep. way to add. And and if you're running on an old ver old computer that you haven't used in a while, make sure you're updated because they actually moved from OBS to OBS Studio. Right. Mm. What about three years ago or so? Yeah. And that basically they started over with the code base, um, but they cleaned it up a lot. Studio is. Where you should be. Really yeah. quite stable and quite impressive. Don't really have a question. My name is Media Magnum, one of his moderators, but I just have a couple things to add. Um, do, you, do you guys talk when you're talking about capture cards? I, Ily and I found a really good one for Linux capture that worked right out of the box. The, um, oh, sorry. Yeah. I'll squat down. <laughs> <laughs> you get him a chair. No, you're fine. Freaky noise. Go. But we found a really good one that works in Linux. Uh, it's made by Mirrorbox, generic one. Ran about 70 to 100. He got his kind of cheap. I got mine on the higher end, same model. Depends on which reseller you catch it from. But it works in Linux natively. Uh, a little dark on the colors, but that can be fixed in post. <laughs> I'll add to that. I had a Hornet Tech that I donated to my church. The, the a similar capture price. card, yeah. Yeah, $70 yeah. capture price. At least for me, it worked well as long as I was only giving it 720p or 1080p. Oh, this, Anything less than that, This bad. worked on my <laughs> Super Famicom, my PS4. 
my PS2 the whole okay. the whole across yeah, the whole board. Nice. I also did through a GitHub repo get the Game Capture HD working oh, in nice. Linux. Mm -hmm. Bit of a weirdness. I had to buy a splitter for it because the computer, the Game Capture HD stuff for Linux takes YUV and the splits out to your monitor needing RGB for some reason after you do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll add on to that, we didn't even get a chance to really dive into it, but I, I use a Datapath Vision card, and if you uh, eBay these things, you can see them anywhere from like 80 to 150 bucks, and they're wonderful. They yeah, Datapath is very well regarded. They've yeah. accepted everything I've sent at it, and it's been quite a, gam a gamut. Mm -hmm. of, uh, and they <laughs> just yeah. fix their firmware that, so, and, and drivers, so they will work directly in OBS now. Awesome. We will take one more. Go for it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, what other kind of challenges that might come up in terms of capturing like arcade hardware? Uh, for example, uh, I mean, granted, once you get to like the early '80s and whatnot, those are going to be all over the place. But like in particular, I have um, some games that run on what's called arcade low res, mm -hmm. which is basically it's 320, but it's a 15 kilohertz horizontal. Uh, so it's not your standard VGA, but even though it does use the HD 15 connector. Yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what to use for that? Yeah, Those yeah, pretty much. So I, I do uh, arcade as well on my stream. Um, the OSSC so far, I'm not going to knock because the mics will pick it up. But let's just assume that I knocked on wood. Uh, so far, the the OSSC through to my Magewell has managed to to handle everything that I've thrown at it. Um, you might need to go one extra step to clean up the signal. With yeah, I do. Like I do go through the DVDO as well. But all that to say, the OSSC has not freaked out yet. Uh, your challenge is going to be find an intermediary board. Um, I use a small cab for my arcade hardware that uh, will take in signal and then give you RGB out. Uh, once you have RGB out, this handles just about anything that I throw at it. Okay. Thank you. Um, with that being said, thank you all for joining us. Um, we really appreciate it. And I would like to personally thank uh, Duango, Tina, and Evan for joining us. Um, it's, this is uh, I, 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 very, I love this stuff, and I wish I knew more about it. And just, I've learned so much in the 24 hours it's been spending the time with just putting this whole thing together. So, uh, thank you all very much. Thank you all for being here, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your uh, GDQ. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Yeah.